Hi, and welcome back to the next pregame episode of the Wooden Dojo. This episode is an interview that I was able to do with the Ninja Crusade 2nd Edition RPG creator, Eloy Lasanta. This interview actually took place at Gen Con 49 in 2016, following Third Eye Games' successful Kickstarter release of the Ninja Crusade. While parts of the interview were lost when the website it was hosted on went down, our interaction stuck with me, and I became a huge fan of Eloy, Third Eye Games, and the Independent Game Designer Network. Looking at your history as far as gaming and everything else goes, uh, I know that you were involved with Margaret Weiss, getting in yeah. on uh, some games, and Baby Bestiary, which is a wonderful book. A lot yeah. of my friends are huge fans of that. Uh, the artwork is amazing, everything else. Tell me a little bit about yourself. The RPGs, uh, what really got you into it? What are the RPGs that you enjoy? Well, I mean, I, I'm a little bit of an odd ball when it comes to my first gaming experiences. You know, a lot of people say, well, obviously it was D&D or White Wolf, and, you know, those are kind of the staple answers of what people's first, um, you know, experiences with RPGs were. But mine was, like, with Rifts, so I was kind of the oddball there. Um, but I played Rifts for many, many years, very happily, uh, before I actually started kind of branching out and finding other things and really kind of finding my niche. And I still kind of... I still kind of go back and I like read those Rips books and you know stuff like that every so often because you know they kind of have a special place in my heart. <laughs> but um, you know, getting into and getting into the gaming professionally, it actually happened uh, pretty organically. It was um, I had already been writing lots of material uh, for White Wolf. I did a lot of fan stuff for White Wolf that I had kind of just thrown up online. Uh, I actually have a really interesting story about how I was talking with some of the developers of White Wolf because I wasn't friends with them. I was a nobody at the time, but I had friends who wrote for White Wolf, so I was hanging out with the White Wolf people just kind of on the side, and they were just like, well, what stuff have you written? And I said, well, I wrote this cool thing called The Empty Hand, and it was a martial arts companion for the New World of Darkness, and the developers all turned to me, and they were like, oh, we all use that thing. And I was just like, oh. you know, it's like that's it was like, you know, that sort of kind of experience. And I was just like, so, you know, obviously I was like, okay, so the stuff I write is kind of viable then here a little bit because it's not official, but even the people who design the games themselves are already using it. Um, so then I was just like, well, let me see if I can get some writing gigs. And I got a couple, uh, but I, and I kind of learned how the process worked from going through that end of the process. Uh, and then I was just like, I think I can. I, I have these ideas and I want to put them out. And the experiences that I had had was I have these ideas and I want to put them in your game. And they go, uh, I don't, it's a little much for this game. Why don't we make it like this, which is kind of the opposite of what you just made it. Um, so I, was like, I started kind of feeling a little bit stunted creatively, even just with a couple of things that I did. And I was just like, I think I just want to make my own games so that I can put whatever I want in my games and just have it there. And I don't have anybody telling me that I can't do that. Absolutely. You know, so that and that's and then that's where Third Eye Games started, 2008, um, with the release of Apocalypse Prevention Inc., which was my very first game. Excellent. So uh, obviously very involved in Kickstarter, getting games out on Kickstarter, yeah. which has kind of become kind of a new industry thing. Kind of. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's a great way to get you know your funding as well as unify nationally. I mean, it's almost it's it's both advertising and a few other things. I, I thought you had a very successful Kickstarter. I feel like uh, you've been the most consistent out of all the companies that I've seen or you know really gotten on board with. Do you have any like uh, thoughts on that or any uh, recommendations you have for people getting into Kickstarter trying to put out a game? Well, you know, it's 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 funny the way that kind of I kind of got into Kickstarter right before the big boom, where then everybody and their mom had a Kickstarter. Um, because that was my very first Kickstarter was Part Time Dons, and uh, it went. You know, surprisingly well, I asked for like three thousand, and I ended up with like eight. You know, which which was like huge at the time, uh, <laughs> which was still underestimating what I actually needed for that game. Uh, but that's you know, that's before people knew everything about budgeting for a Kickstarter and everything. I'm way better at it now. Yeah. But you know, now I'm actually running like my fifteenth Kickstarter at this point. I you know, I run a, a couple a year at the, um, but. It's it, you know it is all kind of about budgeting and everything. It is all about being consistent with the information that you have. I've seen a lot of Kickstarters that just give you everything up front, which then gives you nothing to engage later on and during and get you excited about things during the Kickstarter. Um, so there 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 is something to say about giving everything up front because then people don't have to wade through updates, but get them to want to back it. But at the same time, 
um, the people who have backed it, I like to give them stuff to be excited about that they keep coming back and they want to just keep talking about it. Not, you know, on day one they hit back and then they just back away and they do, they do other things and you just ignore it at that point. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at with, you know, Kickstarter is, you know, I do use it as a lot of promotion, uh, you know, the way that that works is that, you know, they take a percentage, but I just chalk that up to a promotional fee because you kind of have to because it's allowing you to reach everybody, like you said, kind of all around the world. Like, I have a lot of fans in Australia, specifically, like, I sent a lot of packages to Australia for some reason. Uh, um, and I have a lot of fans, um, I have a few fans in Japan and um, some fans over in Austria and France. Uh, and, you know, I, so, I mean, but these are people I would never have been able to market to directly except to, except for Kickstarter being there. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those... And, and, and honestly, I love the back and forth between me as the creator and the, the backers as the Kickstarter backers. Like, the games that I make and that I put on Kickstarter are the game that I said that I was going to make and then the backer said, well, wouldn't it be cool if it also had something like this? And I said, yes, it would be cool if it had something like that. I'll be sure to put that in. You know, so you get the feedback of what the people want and then you give them what they want. Sure enough, you know, I have 14 successful Kickstarters and I'm on my 15 yep. because, you know, you give the people what they want. Right now, as far as Kickstarters that are out, I know that you have the expansion for uh, Ninja Crusade yeah. out right now. What, what information can you share about that or even the direction of Ninja Crusade? How do you feel it's going or where do you think it's going? Well, it's it's... One of the things that I wanted to do when I released the second edition of Ninja Crusade, which was a game that wasn't even super widely known, I've had a few people come up and go like, second edition? Where's first edition? You know, because it, it was a game that um, on the surface looked difficult but really wasn't. Um, but what I did is I, I took a look at that and I stripped out everything that might confuse a player or make it seem weird or anything like that and made it very streamlined and then like everybody can, everybody can pick it up and be like, I get this and I want to play this. Uh, so um, there are no perception problems with the second edition, which is really cool because a lot of people have already jumped on board. Uh, we had over 250, no, we had, we had over 320, somewhere around there. Um, backers of the original Kickstarter, and um, a lot of those were for physical copies of the book, which came out amazingly beautiful. <laughs> and it, it's, and again, it's like I am growing both creatively and business wise. Like, this was my very first offset print. I've been doing print on demand for years, but this was my first where I said, I'm going to take a chunk of money and I'm going to invest it in 500 copies of this book because I know that I will be able to sell 500 copies of this book quite easily, and, um, and that's going to bank more quality and better construction and everything for the backers. That meant that I had to ask for more money from Kickstarter. I had to have a few, a few more backers, but in the end, the product was better that way. You know, sure enough, I think we have, I think we have like 80 copies left or something like that out Amazing. of that initial 500. Yeah. So it's that, that's why the, the newest Kickstarter for Empire's Reign is, excuse me, both for Empire's Reign, but also for another print run so we can get some more copies of the book. Otherwise, there won't be any, <laughs> um, which is a, a wonderful problem to have. Uh, so I can't, not complaining here at all. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's um, the direction of the game I think is, is going really well. We actually were able to convert all of the first edition material over to second edition uh, pretty quickly. Uh, I think the book was released about three months ago and then like since then we've been getting everything together so that we can get all of the second edition material out and now it's ready now we're time now it's time to come up with the new material mm -hmm. instead of just converting the old material and empire's reign is our first thing that we're doing because um it's going to allow us to kind of explore the other side of the war uh, so instead of you playing ninja versus the army you're playing the soldiers versus the army of ninjas that you're being sent to go and rid the world of because they're a nuisance and that they're terrible and they're dragging the world down with them and you know you're a soldier and you're trying to provide for your family and you have you know, you're a patriot because you're fighting for your country. And it's, you know, it's like, it's, if you look at it from the ninja standpoint, it's just like kill, 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 kill. But each of those, each of those soldiers you killed was a person. Each of those soldiers had a story of their own. And that's kind of what Empire's Reign is about, uh, is for you to kind of explore what it's like to be a soldier in a world that's kind of dominated uh, by ninja. Hmm. 
during this convention, I believe your booth is located at the IGDN uh, table or area? Yes, yeah. I'm the president of the IGDN. Really? Congratulations yeah. on oh, that. Thank you. It's my last term, so I'm out, I'm out at the end of the year. But <laughs> I've, I've been, this is my second year of being the president, and um, it's, uh, it's a wonderful organization, the IGDN, the Indie Game Developers Network. Um, we actually have over 70 members now, uh, each member being um, independent publisher and creator who uh, collectively we are able to assist each other in business, um, uh, advice, and um, and also uh, things like this. Like we have the IGN Gen Con Gaming Room because as one company, they'd be like, no, you have that table over there in that room because that's what we're going to give you. But as 70 companies, we say we want our own space. They give us our own space. Um, same thing with us getting a booth. We have a booth share thing. So that even if you alone can't get into a Gen Con booth, together we can all sell each other's things, and uh, it's it's really fun. it's a fun collective uh, thing. And on the back end, you know, we have lots of perks. Um, like I said, not only the email list where we talk to each other about industry things, and business, um, but just being a member of the IGN can get you in a lot of doors and can get you some discounts on some really important things that you need as a business, as a business person. Because we've gone through, we've made those deals with uh, companies that support independent gaming, and there are a lot of people out there that support independent gaming uh, more more so than you even think, which is fun. I've gotten way better at it as I've gone along. <laughs> Because um, when I started, uh, I didn't have a lot of money to hire a lot of people, so it was just me. And I was like, so if I want this book laid out, I'm gonna have to learn how to do layout. And if I want, you know, if I want to write this stuff, I'm gonna have to learn how to write it. And then I hired an editor and I hired artists because, but I, but I hired my friends because I knew artists. <laughs> and I was like, will you do this for like really cheap, please? Because I have like zero money. Um, but it, you know, and now. You know that was eight years ago, and this and now I'm going on my third year of doing this full time because now I do make enough money. So yeah. you know it's like you have to put the work in at the beginning. You have to pay your dues, as as some would say. But you know what? That's not even true anymore because if you have a really cool idea and you throw it on Kickstarter, you might just become instantly popular and everybody loves you. Um, that was not my story, of course, though. So. Yeah. <laughs> IDGN, and this, you know, one last direction I wanted to go in this interview. You did talk about on the website for the IGDN mm -hmm. uh, diversity yeah. and inclusion. Yeah. Maybe you could share a little bit of something with that. Well, it's, I mean, it's part of our mission statement, definitely. Um, we want to. We want to promote a community and an atmosphere in gaming where anybody is invited to come in and experience the games and have a good time. And that includes creating more games that the player can see themselves in. And that means, uh, and, and there's actually been a lot of strides in diversity in the industry, which I'm actually really, uh, I, I'd like to think that the IGN is helping push that along. But I think some people are just coming across this phenomena of, hey, maybe we don't just want a bunch of just, you know, older white men playing our games. You know, if we put people of color, if we put people of different orientations and whatnot in our games, then those people will be attracted to the games and want to experience those games because they don't think that they're being ignored or they're being marginalized uh, in the settings and in the games themselves. So, I mean, I know myself in Third Eye Games, I make a Anytime I like write up regions, I make sure that it's equal parts men and women. Um, there's definitely people of color in there. There's people of different ethnicities in there. People, people of different orientations and whatnot. I mean, like, so you might pick up the, you know, the characters and you might like, you know, like a profile pic, and you're like, cool. And you read the backstory, and you're like, oh, this person is not just ninja. This person is ninja and, you know, a mother and also, you know, doing all this other stuff. I mean, there's uh, a lot of different dimensions to characters and they can't, you know, it's like human fighter is not all that human fighter is. You know, that human fighter has a family, they have a personality, they have wants and they have needs and that's kind of where um, a lot of the other games kind of do diversity better than some of the ones that are like the standard that people, you know, talk about. Um, and there are games that are, are like are geared directly towards these sorts of things and that's kind of part of what the IGDN is, is there for, like, we want to promote and we want to help creators of, you know, awesome, these awesome new projects that are inclusive to people. We want to help them get these out and we want to help spread the word. Um, we also do um, 
we all, and we're also looking to have more people of color um, and you know people of diversity in the industry itself. Um, we actually do what's uh, a Metatopia scholarship every year. Um, this is I think we're going on our third year now, where we actually raise funds to send designers from game designers from marginalized communities to Metatopia. Which and if anybody knows Metatopia, it's run by the um, uh, Double Exposure people. And um, it's basically like a playtesting, like experience. Like it's it's like the game designer's dream, where you go and you talk to other game designers who are designing games right now. Um, and we 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 sent one person, um, we sent one woman uh, the first year, and then last year, which was our second year doing it, we sent four people um, from uh, from across the spectrum of of diversity. Um, and what we're hoping is that by uh, helping these people be, you know, brought into the community and giving them the the encouragement for them to kind of take that step forward themselves, um, that we're just going to make the world more inclusive and just everything's just going to be better.